One of the big questions that Christians and non-Christians alike have is why do bad things happen? And usually it's why do bad things happen to good people? But if you're a Christian, you understand that there are no good people, right? We're all dead people saved by grace. Now we're alive in Christ, but we're still not good. Jesus is good. We're just peons. Uh, we know where to go for why, you know, so to speak. Uh, and yet it's one of those issues that we need to have it so kind of wrapped around our minds, uh, biblically, that we can answer people's questions. Or at the very least, point them in a direction. Whether they're Christians or non-Christians. It's going to be different how that goes, but um, what we see here in John chapter 9 is it's a different section for dealing with this issue, and yet the questions that the disciples have is a kind of question that is that why kind of question. And will lead into us looking at the book of Job and a few other places. And we'll learn some things about how we're to interact with others who are suffering, and then how we are to walk through these things as well. So John chapter 9. We read, As he passed by, he saw a man blind from birth, and his disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned? This man or his parents that he was born blind. And Jesus answered, It was not that this man sinned or his parents, but that the works of God might be displayed in him. We must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. Night is coming when no one can work. As long as I'm in the world, I am the light of the world. So, they see this guy in mind, and their inclination, their supposition is he sinned. Or the parent sins that this guy has been blind from birth. And they didn't come into that opinion out of a vacuum. It, it was the teaching of the rabbis, and uh, they had some of these things in their teaching as a culture, and all these things. But rather than look at this poor blind man that, with compassion and with what can we do? Can you heal him? Can you touch him? They've already been around Jesus for a little bit, so they could surmise that Jesus could do something. Their first inclination is, did he sin? What did he do wrong? What did his parents do? And sometimes we do that when things are going on in our lives or in other people's lives, or the pain or suffering, but what did they do? They probably deserve it. Now, there is a place, and we'll get to it briefly, but just tuck it away for discipline. You know, God disciplines those who love, he loves, and sometimes the pain and suffering you go through is God's discipline to get you back on track. And no one likes dis discipline, right? It's not like, please sign me up. Uh, no, no, but it's helpful and it's purposeful. This is not that. But here's what Ezekiel 18 and 20 says. Yep. There you are. The soul who sins shall die. But the father suffer for the iniquity of the son, the righteous of the Righteousness of the righteous shall be upon himself, and the wickedness of the wicked shall be upon himself. So that's the book of Ezekiel. Prior to the disciples' time, they didn't recall this verse. They're like, man, what's your problem? Well, did you? <laughs> no, me neither. Uh, it's a perplexing question. Who's to blame is a common question for the problems that are going on. If someone's suffering, we want to blame someone. They must have. They probably deserved it. They probably did something. And this understanding in the Old Testament also comes through where God visits the iniquity upon further generations in Ezekiel chapter 20. But, or in Exodus chapter 20. But in Ezekiel, the God's heart here is not to damn you because of your parents or your grandparents, but that he continues to deal with sin in people's life. Right? It's an ongoing thing for each generation. So, like, after a couple of minutes, Jamie, you can, like, go back to yep. the other. Yep. you got to pay attention. Seth, you probably should leave the little area. Thank you. He's going to be on target. Yeah. Um, and so... Yeah, Exodus chapter 20, verse 5, talks about iniquity going to further generations and kind of that building on itself. Ezekiel 
saying that's not God's heart, but he's actually just convicting in each generation. And so the disciples are just looking to blame. They're not looking for compassion. And then we get Jesus' answer. It's a surprising answer. Because if you're suffering, you're in pain, and you hear, well, this is so God's work can be displayed. What's your reaction going to be to that? Like, uh, get the guy over here. Like, why me? Like, it's, it, that's not helpful. Right? <laughs> you wonder if the guy heard them. Having this little conversation. He's not deaf, he's just blind. <laughs> This man didn't stand on his parents, but it's so that God's work will be displayed in him. They're like, what? That can be difficult. And he must work the works of him who sent him while his day and night is coming in the morning. Well, all of this and this verse and these ideas of the works of God might be displayed in him follow chapter 8, because it's chapter 9. And in chapter 8, Jesus said in chapter 8, verse 12, And the light of the world, whoever follows me, will not walk in darkness, will have the light of life. And then John 11, verse 4, This sickness will not end in death, is for God's glory, so that God's Son may be glorified through it. That was referencing Lazarus, another opportunity where, you know, yeah, Lazarus is sick. All right, let's hang out for a while. Lazarus is dead. Yeah, that's a bummer. Like, he cried, but he's going to raise him from the dead well, so that God's power might be displayed. Lazarus is thinking, why me? <laughs> and so when we think about these things, and we think about sickness, we think about pain and suffering and evil and the things that happen, there are points in time in some situations where God redeems, God uses those things for a bigger purpose. We were talking earlier in the back there about God being outside of time. And our biggest problem for us is we just don't get a lot. We think we understand who God is. We think we understand a lot of things about God. But he's God. And we'll see a verse about that a little later. And so that's the case here. That the works of God will be displayed in him. John Corson says, It's true that all sadness and sorrow are the indirect result of sin. But Jesus says no one can point a finger at another as the culprit. I talk to many people who say the reason they are vulnerable to the occult or pornography is because the vulnerability has been passed from generation to generation in their family. Scripture, however, teaches exactly the opposite. In the days of his equal, people would justify their own sin with the proverb that said, The fathers have eaten sour grapes, and the children's teeth are set in age. God, however, said, As I live, you shall not have occasion anymore to use this proverb in Israel. Behold, all souls are mine. Ezekiel chapter 18. In other words, every single soul is created by me, belongs to me, and is individually responsible to me. You can't blame your dad, your grandpa, your great grandpa, because you're going down a black hole. Right? <laughs> Could you have tendencies and propensities toward things? Sure. You're still responsible for making the decision and the choices that you make. Here, there's no sin. It's going to be so does. Glory is displayed, his work. And again, we can all say, I'm glad that was him and not me. Um, so go to the book of Job, if you have a finger there. Because if anyone has a beef with God, you know, it's Mr. Job. This is where we first learn about this whole idea of cosmic things and battles and things coming through. God allowing certain things for ultimately his glory. Job chapter 1. There was a day, verse 6, when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan also came among them. The Lord said to Satan, From where have you come? Which again, he already knows, right? It's not like he lost Satan. We <laughs> need to put a tracker on that guy. From going to and fro on the earth and from walking up and down on it. And the Lord said to Satan, have you considered my servant Job, that there's none like him on earth, a blameless and upright man who fears God and turns away from evil? Okay, that don't point yet. Right? That's what we should be praying. 
Why? Because the next verse, Satan answered the Lord and said, Does Job fear God for no reason? Has he not put a hedge around him and his house and all that he has on every side? This has been weakness, it's dreamery. Uh, you have blessed the work of his hands and his possessions have increased in the land. But stretch out your hand and touch all that he has and he will curse you to your face. And the Lord said to Satan, Behold, all that he has is in your hand. Only against him do not stretch out your hand. So Satan went out from the presence of the Lord. And we know what happens, right? He's just having a normal day. Life is going. He's singing. He's having a wonderful time. He's having a party. And then everyone dies. All his animals are killed. All his kids die. You're like, what just happened? His wife's got an answer. Not a good one. But she's got an answer. Right? But Job had an answer. Verse 20. Job arose and tore his robe and shaved his head and fell on the ground and worshipped. He said, Naked I came from my mother's womb, naked shall I return. The Lord gave and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. And all this Job did not sin or charge God with wrong. Matt Redman turned that into a song. Blessed be the name of the Lord, and he gives and takes away. And he sang that song of comforts, and he talked about, you know, he's been leading it you know, for 20 years. He said, but it's still written. You know, it's not like just, oh, why well, is it wrong? Because it's scripture. You know? God's in charge. And Job is like, okay. Like, how is he okay? Because, you know, God's in charge. His trust isn't in. What he has and he's accumulated, even in his family, he's, he's held them like this. Right earlier in the chapter, when he would go and make sacrifice for them just in case, he was like, Lord, they're yours. I'm, I'm going to do what I can to get them on the right track, but they're yours. And then, of course, his health gets attacked. And that's when his wife's like, you know, curse God and die. Shall we receive good from God, and shall we not receive evil? And all this, Job did not sin with his lips. Now, think about, you know, we'll just make it easy. You know, when a guy gets sick, the world is over, right? Like, a woman can get sick and, you know, still be caring for kids, working, and doing all these things, and a guy gets sick and everything shuts down. What do you have? I have the sniffles. You know, it's like really bad. And I've got a headache and, you know, I'm out for days. Or then I'm getting piled with all kinds of vitamins. That's more likely. Here, Job, sicker than it all, he's got boils. He's scraping himself with broken pottery, sitting in ashes. Messed up beyond belief. And his wife's like, Yeah, this is not working. Let's hold God in. Let's just curse God and kick the bucket, dude. But the first the little bit she says before that, do you still hold fast to your integrity? Mm. Are you still holding that God's good? Are you still holding that He's loving? That He's in charge? It's like, yeah. Do you accept just good from God and not evil? The rain falls on the righteous and the unrighteous. Right? You don't get a little tent that moves and covers you as you go. Be cool. Right? <laughs> well, what's with them? Well, they're a Christian. Oh. <laughs> I mean, it'd be helpful, right? You know, be able to know who's who and what's going on. I mean, the nation of Israel kind of had that for a season. But it didn't help them. They had a pillar of fire at night. They had the cloud to lead them by day. They still grumbled and complained and turned from God and didn't trust Him. When things were tough, when things looked bad, when there were giants in the land, they didn't say, hey, God's got this. Look what He's done already. We've walked across the Red Sea when it was dry. Might have been a good time to go, God's got this. No. Job is that example. Unwittingly involved in something he didn't know. He's proving in his reaction that 
good or bad, our lives aren't to be, our walk with God isn't based upon if God's been good to us. He is good. We sang. He's faithful. But our definition is not always the same. Because the end result doesn't mean puppies and flowers and whatever it is that makes you happy, right? Like all the time. It's, it's, it's cats don't fit. You know, <laughs> it's, it's a life that he's first. And so good, bad, ugly, pain, suffering, he's still good. He's still God. He hasn't left. He hasn't abandoned you. And so God says, Jesus says, there's no sin, but that's so God's work might be displayed in you. And what if, what if, when things happen in our lives, we looked at a situation and not as the worst thing ever, and why me, and oh boy, but how is God going to use this? In what way will God use this horrible thing in our life for something good? Now, it might not be something you're able to say in the moment, likely not, you know, depending on how severe it is, but... For many things, there's just an irritation, there's a, something that's not totally crippling you, you're not in the hospital on a ventilator, so you, you know, you're able to think and speak, you're not in a coma, so most sickness or pain or suffering or trials that you're going through, you're conscious, you're able to still kind of go through life and you have to kind of just get up and keep going. And in those moments, you could say, how's God going to use this for me? What's God going to do? So we go back. It says we must work the works of Him who sent me. Lord, this day light is coming when no one can work. Time is now. Not once or later down the road when things are better or when the world looks better, when there's a better government, or when this gets fixed, or that gets fixed, but the time is now to do the things God has for you to do. Even in the pain, even in the suffering that you're going through. Many of you have heard of Johnny Erickson, Tata, I don't know uh, She was paralyzed at 17, just diving into a lake that wasn't quite as deep as she thought. And you know, she's lived this long life and gone through not just being paralyzed from like the neck down or something like that. Uh, you know, had cancer in recent years and, you know, a bunch of things, but written all kinds of books, done art with her mouth. I mean, all kinds of things. Why? Because after a few weeks, I think the story goes, of moaning and asking to die, um, there was a change and a turn and committed to what is God going to do with my life. Most of us are never going to have to experience that to get to that place, hopefully, right? Because that's not what you're asking for. But God has purposes for us to do. And if you're still here, it's time to do them. And so that's going to be this man's story. And the disciples, they weren't worried about any of those things. They're just like, yeah, someone messed up here. And so Jesus, of course, then is going to do what? He's going to heal him. He's going to make a little mud pile and spit in the ground and throw that mud on the guy's eye. Like, there's a mud, there's the mud in your eye. <laughs> and the guy's going to see. And what's he going to do? Well, it was a big deal that he could see. The religious guys aren't happy. Because it was a Sabbath. You can't do good on the Sabbath, apparently. And so they asked him, how did this happen? Well, he doesn't know exactly, right? Because he was blind. <laughs> but said, what am I? And watched and I see. And they kind of are arguing about themselves. They go to the parents and they're arguing with the parents and they're like, uh, I'm not as bad as ask him. He's old enough. <laughs> Verse 24. So the second time they called the man who had been blind and said to him, Give glory to God. We know that this man is a sinner. Talking about Jesus. 
He answered, Whether he's a sinner or not, I do not know. One thing I do know, that though I was blind, now I see. It's that simple. He just explained and expressed what happened to him. He told his story. I was blind, but now I see. And spiritually speaking, that's our story, right? You were blind, but now you see. So you all have a story, whether you're in pain, suffering, or problems, whatever, we still have a story. What did he do to you? How did he open your eyes? I told you already, you would not listen. Why do you want to hear it again? Do you also want to become his disciples? He's already an evangelist. He just is telling what he knows. We get caught up in like, well, I don't know if I have the right things to say. You just do what you know. What do you know? You get to talk about that. And when you're in pain and suffering, and if you come through it even, there's an even greater opportunity to talk about what has happened in your life and what God has done. But often we're inward looking in these things. But all this, you know, is also a teaching time for the disciples. That is, regardless of what's going on, it's time to work. It's time to, to move and to be invited along in the mission of Jesus to reach the world. And suffering and tragedy. We often look inward and we complain and wonder why. But if we take the time to go, we got it. In most cases, it's not going to be the rest of your life in that situation. Unless you're paralyzed. Most of the times, pain or suffering or things you're going through is temporary, it's seasonal. And so you pick out this season, I'm going to praise you. I'm saying that song. I'm going to choose to praise you. I'm going to speak forth truth about what's happening. And I want to allow you to work in this situation. So you talk about what you know. And once was blind, but now I see. His understanding grew, even in that short term. He, he started by talking about the man. He then talks to him as if he's the Lord, or a I'm not a sinner, he's the one that healed me, and at the end of it, we'll see, you know, he's the Christ. There's understanding that grows along the way. Go back to Job for a second. I want to just kind of wrap up a little bit here in Job's life. There's a lot in Job. If you haven't read through the book of Job, I'm really encouraging. I mean, there's parts that get tedious, let's be real. Uh, I mean, there's Chapters and chapters where his friends are talking. You know, oh, that's what I don't know. Friends? Well, that's what they're called, all right? I'm not telling you. <laughs> they started off well by sitting and doing nothing. And then they started talking. We're getting close to the end of the friends talk. And Job asserts himself in chapter 34, verse 10. Therefore, hear me, you men of understanding. Far be it from God that he should do wickedness, and from the Almighty that he should do wrong, and that he should act unjustly. Because they are going through as if, you know, again, like the disciples, who probably have sinned, probably have done something. You think you're so great and high and mighty, you know, you probably did something. Where's this God of yours? What's his problem? And Job is like, listen, it's impossible for God to do wrong or to act unjustly. Bottom line. And they go back and forth some more. And the really fun part of this book is in chapter 38, 39, and 40. Like this is where, like, when you get to heaven, can you cue that one up for Like, I want some popcorn, I want to sit and watch that. <laughs> watch what? When God addresses Job. <laughs> the Lord answered Job out of the whirlwind and said, like, where were you? <laughs> when I... <laughs> <laughs> like, you weren't consulted, Joe. You didn't have any role in this. And he just goes on and on. It's so good. Chapter 38, 39. He challenges him. Calls him out. Talks about...
to the, the Leviathan. Let's think of dinosaur. It's before we had the word dinosaur. Just read it. Chapter 42. I know that you can do all things, and no purpose of yours can be thwarted. That's a good place to stop. Right? I know that you can do everything, and your purposes won't be thwarted. And then he goes after his friends. That's what too. Why is that true? Well, because Isaiah 55 tells us, my thoughts are not your thoughts, and your ways are not my ways. We don't have it all figured out. We don't understand all these things. Because we're not God. We're not little gods. We're not going to be a God. Isaiah 55, verse 9, verse the heaven are, heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. For as the rain and the snow come down from heaven and do not return there, but the water of the earth, making it bring forth and sprout, giving seed to the sower and bread to the eater, so shall my word be that goes out from my mouth, it shall not return to me empty, it shall accomplish that which I purpose, and shall succeed in the thing for which I sent it. You shall go out in joy, be led forth in peace. The mountains and the hills before you shall break forth into singing. All the trees of the field shall clap their hands. Let's see what's happening. When it comes to pain and suffering and why and all these things, it's not the blame time. It's not the blame game time. That's where the cycles belong. It's an opportunity for God to shine. The psalmist writes in Psalm 119, a really good psalm. It's really long, but it's all about God's word. Psalm 119, verse 71. It is good for me that I was afflicted, that I might learn your statutes. It's in the pain that we learn who God is. Hmm. We don't have time, and you are aware of it, the life of Joseph. There's a, there's a life. Following God. That should be great. Right? She had a wonderful life. What happened to Joseph? What? Well, wasn't he like second in command? Yeah, you're forgetting a few years. What happened in the meantime? His brother beat him up, sold him as a slave to people heading just away from him towards Egypt. He gets sold again. He ends up in Potiphar's house, hanging out there, doing a good job, gets falsely accused, ends up in jail, tells some dreams. Still in jail. I mean, for anyone to go, man, this fallen God thing's not working out so well. It could have been Joseph. But we know how that story ends. Genesis chapter 50 is he has his brothers there, and they're all like, oh no, he's going to get us now. He's like, you meant for evil, but God meant it for good. Like, he's way above you, he's way above me. He had the right perspective. Romans chapter 5 says this, not only that, but we rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope. And hope does not put us to shame, because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. We like to go and just skip all the suffering, and yet it's part of the package deal. The end of chapter 9, they cast out the man of the temple area, and Jesus heard it. They cast him out and found him and said, Do you believe in the Son of Man? Which is a title for the Messiah. And he answered, And who is he, sir, that I may believe in him? But Jesus said to him, You have seen him, and it is he who is speaking to you. He said, Lord, I believe, and you worship him. And Jesus said, For judgment I came into this world, that those who do not see may see, and those who see may become blind. Some of the Pharisees near him heard these things and said to him, Are we also blind? Jesus said to them, If you are blind, you have no guilt. But now that you say and we see, your guilt remains. But yeah, you're blind. This man had a physical ailment, but he had a deeper meaning. And because of the opportunity that the disciples missed, in all that, Jesus brings them to that place where 
no, no, this is it. This is not really about you. But it is about you. It wasn't a sin, it wasn't, you know, I didn't eat the wrong foods, you know, it wasn't any of those things, it was, it said, God will be glorified. And eventually, so this guy can come to believe. Our pain and suffering is never wasted when we allow it to be used by God for His good and for His will. How do we come alongside friends and people that suffer? Well, not like Job's friends, beyond the first week, right? Like that first few moments where they just hung out. That was good. And then they started talking. Uh, not, even if you've had the exact same situation, it's not the same. How it affects you is how it affects someone else. So you can't, you can just be with them. And we can come alongside people gently. There's a lot of other places we can go to talk about these things. And hopefully in our discussion times we'll have just that opportunity to talk about you know, how we deal with pain and suffering, how we see these things, and what do we do with them. And maybe you're going through a season where things are not good and there's some problems and you're like, yeah, how do I handle these things? It comes back to who's God in your life? Who's Jesus? Who's the Messiah? Is he king and lord of for all or if he's just big wish in the sky of you know, making things better so I can have a good life. American blessing. Bless me, God. The blessings of God aren't necessarily what we think they are. The goodness of God doesn't always mean what we think it means. He's always good. He's always faithful. So I'm honest then to go, okay, even when in spite of affliction, in spite of pain, in spite of suffering, I'm not going to throw them away. I'm not going to reject them. I'm going to turn towards them even more and cause those times to be times of growth and times of opportunity for me to share with other people. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for eyes to see. Lord, as we sit here in this room, we're, for the most part, able to see physically. There's some issues with glasses and contacts and age and these things, but through that scripture that we would all see. We would recognize that we were dead, we were blind, but now that we see spiritually who Jesus is, now that we're alive in Christ, that whatever will come will be used in our life for your glory. No one's going around asking for hard things or more pain or more suffering. We know those things are just part of the fallen world. But we also understand from the book of Job that these things also pass through your hands. And again, that could cause strife in us or that could cause us great comfort to know that there's a limit, to know that there's a point, to know that God has something good in store through this through this suffering, through this tragedy. That he's working something out in me. He's, he's maturing me in ways that just having no pain would do. So continue to speak to us and instruct us. We would walk with you. In Jesus' name.